Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your love, Father. Thank you that you've called us here, Lord, to show us your word, to show us your goodness, to show us your love for us. And I pray, Father, that we'd be blessed by your word today. I pray your spirit would please, Holy Spirit, do the teaching, do the revealing. For we pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone says, <laughs> y'all remember the theme for this year? Jesus, every day. That's right. <laughs> every day with Jesus. We don't want to just uh, talk about Jesus. We, don't, we do want to talk about Jesus, but we don't just want to look at his word in a mechanical way. And uh, we actually want him to be with us and to recognize that he is with us every day. So I want to start off uh, with uh, in Acts chapter 19. We're in verse, uh, starting in verse 23. And uh, let's see, what's been exciting about this is that we get to get nosy, so to speak, about another church. We get to look into the church of Ephesus and say, what was it like there? What did that church do? And and what was going on with them? And so that's a fun thing. The verses that we're looking at at the end of this chapter really don't have a lot of theology in them. Uh, the verses we're looking at at the end, uh, there's not any specific exhortations, but there's plenty to take out of this. It's an incident that took place. You know, another thing that's conspicuous Conspicuously missing from the end of Acts chapter 19 is there's really no quotes from any Christians. It's just all the world and its response to what's been going on with this church. In fact, I call this teaching the church that caused a riot. <laughs> uh, so the two things that I want us to look at are uh, at you know, well, kind of. I want to put two things against each other. And number one, we can try and make things happen in and of ourselves. We can say, "Oh, this would be a good thing. Let's go and do that." Or, you know, "This would be right. So let's make sure we." And that's not right. So let's go after that. Now, that's one way to do it. But there's another way to do it. And that's just to live your life simply following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and let him be the one responsible for the changes that take place. So that, does that just takes the weight off, doesn't it? And I think that's what the Lord wants to do, even as we watch this scene take place. In particular, what we are going to see today is the opposition, excuse me, of the world uh, towards the church. And I think that this could be any church. I think it could be our church. Uh, and so we want to pay attention to that. Uh, how the world may react to us as we begin to follow Jesus Christ. As we actually become different people. You know there was a, uh, there was a uh, revival uh, and that took place here in the United States. And it was a revival that was by folks that were uh, raising donkeys and using them on their farms. I don't know if anybody's heard about this before, but you can check it out. And uh, there was this mass revival and all these folks got saved. And the interesting thing was, is that the donkeys that they had raised or were working with stopped responding to, them, to their, their owners when they were called. And the reason why is because they were such different people. <laughs> they weren't speaking the same. It was the great donkey revival. I don't know if you... And, that, and that's a true story, too. I mean, there are some things that happen to us that if we would just go with it, and not fight against it and not try to make it happen. But relax into this idea that every day I'm going to be with Jesus. Every day I'm going to check in with him. Every day I want to do what it is that pleases him. And then God takes care of the rest. 
I think that as Christians, we can, uh, you know, we can sometimes, you know, let's fight the darkness, you know, uh, which is not a bad thought. Uh, however, better than fighting the darkness every day, you just turn on the light of Jesus Christ and following him. And then he takes care of it. It's, it becomes his responsibility to do, to bring the changes in your life and mine. That's his doing. I could never change myself in the way that God would have me change. So I need to be continually connected with, you know, leaning upon, walking with Jesus Christ in order to see those changes take place in my life. And then what happens is other people begin to be affected by my life. You see, uh, you've probably heard this before, and uh, it's been in a number of sermons, so I'm going to add it to this one. And that is that you could either be a thermometer, or you can be a thermostat. <laughs> if you're a thermometer, all you can do is just gauge the temperature in the room. But if you're a thermostat, it kicks on a heater, you can actually affect the rest of the room and affect the lives around you. Now again, that's not your doing, that's the Lord's doing. And the church that we're going to be looking at or have been looking at is the church of Ephesus and they're definitely a thermostat. Things are happening. People are getting saved. They're living for Jesus. But I want you to understand that as you live for Jesus, um, you might get a couple of different responses from the world. Um, the world might accept the changes that God is doing in your life and be attracted to them. That's awesome. Uh, the world might want to ignore you. Or the world might want to cause a riot against you. And that's the kind of thing we're looking at today. Now, Looking at this riot that took place in the church in the city of Ephesus, it was triggered by a couple of things. So look for a moment with me at Acts chapter 19, verse 19 and 20. What follows in our verses is a direct result of, verse 19, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver, estimated at about $7 million today. Verse 20 says, So the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. So I bet you can imagine seeing the believers standing by and watching these people as they make this awesome open air everybody can see i'm done with my old life i'm gonna follow jesus christ and on account of that you may not recognize me anymore my desires are going to be different the things i say are going to be different the way i treat other people is going to be different i might not be recognizable to you because anybody who puts their faith in jesus christ becomes a new creation Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's what I need to put my attention on. That's where I need to focus my thoughts and my energies towards walking out the new creation that Christ has meant me to be. And as that happens, the Holy Spirit takes the reins of my life. <laughs> Don't you love it in those times where you say something for God and then Afterwards, you go, wow, I, I normally would not say something like that. Uh, I normally would not do that. Um, it must have been God. I don't know of anything better than that. You know, uh, something happens and generally you're, you're too tired to deal with it. But somehow you push through and you say, hey, let me pray for you and let me do it right now. And you just like sail right in to a prayer. Or you need help, 
I'm going to help you out. And then afterwards you go, wow, that was the Holy Spirit directing my life. Because I know me. <laughs> Generally, I would have ignored it or that would have made me angry or I would have put it off. But something has happened inside me. And guess what? I want to go with the flow. And openly, I want everybody to see that there's something different about me. Go ahead, take a look. I'm not perfect, but I know the road that I'm on. And that road is the road I want to stay on. That's what's happening in Ephesus. People are getting saved and they're different. And uh, I mean, imagine this. Imagine you had a community or a city uh, that was <laughs> totally involved, majoring in, involved with uh, witchcraft, um, sexuality, uh, and money. And then all of a sudden, in that community, in that area, everybody started getting saved. What do you think might happen to those trades of <laughs> Of black magic and of sex and they would they would starve wouldn't they see that's what we want to see happen that's the effect that we want to have not only on our own lives to see happen but on the lives of those around us and I'm saying that the best way to make that happen is for for we for us <laughs> for ourselves to just follow along with Jesus every single day well, Jesus in uh, John chapter 8, verse 12, we find him saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. My goodness, wouldn't you like to be walking with the light of life every day? I would think that the light of life within us, the Lord Jesus Christ, would knock off fear, would knock off wonder, would increase our faith. I want to walk where the light is. But as we look at our culture, it seems to be getting darker and darker, wouldn't you say? <laughs> it's uh, obvious as we look around. Uh, something's going on. I, I was uh, thinking, I, I remember back in uh, 2019. You remember that? Let's call that the good old days. So back in the good old days, I remembered thinking, something's changing. Something's, something's different, you know. There's a little different feel in the air or the wind. I remember that. In fact, I think Aileen and I spent some time talking about that way back then in 2019. And uh, lo and behold, uh, this, you know, wind has come in and it's a wind of darkness and it's a wind that doesn't want to turn to God and so many times even in the history of our own nation we have seen where hard times have come and we have seen the whole nation turn to God you see politicians you see leaders you see pastors and everybody's praying everybody prayed like crazy uh, in World War I Everybody prayed like crazy in World War II. Everybody, what they say, uh, say your uh, say your prayers and pass the ammunition. Or I don't remember what the saying was. Praise, that's it. Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. But what have you seen since this pandemic has hit the whole world? Silence when it comes to God. That's a scary thing. Because I know this, when you open the door for evil, it just means that more evil's gonna come in. The door's just gonna get wider. So I look at these things, I was scratching my head, and I was thinking, okay, Lord, what's up? And what I got from the Lord was, he's getting ready to come back. Amen. And some of these things must happen. And so we're not afraid. I think it's rather exciting that God would look at you and God would look at me and say, you're somebody that I need at this time in the world. So I'm going to leave you there. And I'm going to teach you. And I'm going to protect you. And I'm going to lead you. That's an exciting place to be. You know, when, uh, when you purchase a diamond, which I would not know anything about, <laughs> 
But when you do, they put out a black uh, cloth, don't they? And then they put the diamonds on the black cloth. Because that brilliance of a diamond reflects off of that dark background. Well, God does that with believers. He puts us in dark times. And, and he drops the diamonds. That's us. And we shine all the more. So as things get darker, and uh, as you grow in your faith, you're going to look different than the background. The background is the world, the background is the culture, but you're to shine like diamonds. Now, diamonds in and of themselves in a dark room don't shine. They're just as dark as everything else. But when you put a light on the diamond, then it shines. That light is the light of Jesus Christ. And you're going to notice it. I'm hoping you are noticing it in your own life. And other people around you are going to see it. How can you have joy at a time like this? How can you be praying instead of freaking out at a time like this? Why are you not nervous? Why are you so trusting of God? You can see it sometimes on people's faces when they look at you. That's the plan that God has for you. That's the purpose that he has for you. And that is going to fall out on other people. But I also have to tell you that not everybody's going to throw a party when you give your life to Christ. Has anybody experienced that? <laughs> it's like, let's see, uh, uh, I've given up wild living, <laughs> uh, not drinking. <laughs> I'm honest to the core. <laughs> And uh, you don't like that? <laughs> you know? What's the alternative? Go back to the old life? No way. We're in it to win it. Because Christ has won it for us. Let me uh, read for you a little bit, shall I? Uh, Acts chapter 19. Let me read 23 through 34. Then I'll just come back and talk about some of these things. And about that time, that's when people are getting saved. Churches are being planted all over Asia. Uh, people are giving up their, their ways of the culture. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who had made silver shrines to Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together, with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with our hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disres disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! So the whole city was filled with confusion, rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Artistarchus, Macedonians, Paul's traveling companions. And when Paul wanted to go in to the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing, and some another, for the assembly was confused. And most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward 
And Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours, Great is Diana of the Ephesians! Isn't that something? <laughs> what? Well, I, Pastor Mike would have said, what a skit. <laughs> What a thing that is to have happened. If you could imagine that. Now, there's no theology here, as I said before. Paul the Apostle is not even speaking at this. I could just see him wanting to, but he's quiet too. None of the Christians are talking here. Let me talk a little bit about Ephesus. I know you may be familiar with it. It's the seventh wonder of the ancient world with its temple of Diana, the goddess of sex. The temple was truly impressive. It had 127 columns that were 60 feet high. And they were adorned with many sculptures uh, and silver work of Diana, also known as Artemis. If you can imagine that. The temple of Diana was uh, also a major bank. And so, you know, merchants would go there and and they would have their gold and silver and some of their merchandise would be stored there. Kings would put their money there. Even other cities would come and put their holdings into the temple of Diana. Not to mention the fact that every evening, both male and female prostitutes would come out of the temple and would go and earn money for the temple. Of major emphasis in Ephesus, again, was you could kind of whittle it down to uh, sex and money. Uh, not too much different than the world today, would you say? Those are big items in the world. And though the temple built to Diana was eventually uh, buried, it was eventually lost uh, in the centuries past, there are still some ruins there that were dug up. One thing that you won't interestingly find anymore in Ephesus is you won't find any silver. Zero silver, zero money, zero gold there. Uh, I think the Lord took care of that. Well, how did this temple come about to be? All right, catch this. Uh, no laugh track here, but this is what happened. There were some people there in Ephesus, and they are swearing that a giant rock uh, fell from the sky hit the ground, they thought it was a meteor. It was totally dark black. Uh, what has to go through somebody's mind to do this, you know? So the guys picked it up and they said, oh, this is a big black rock, but it fell from Jupiter, they said. So Jupiter must have sent this to us. And they said, well, if you hold the rock at a certain angle and you kind of squint, and when the sun is going down, uh, it kind of looks like a goddess uh, with a lot of breasts. Yeah, that's what it is. So here's my idea. Let's worship it. That's it. That, that's how it all got started. Is that remarkable or what? What must be in the mind of man to, to turn away from God in such an incredible manner? So... Uh, now people started giving their lives to Jesus. And I don't know, you can imagine the sermon by the Apostle Paul when it comes to what, it is, what is it that you worship? In fact, I could even ask you that today. What is it that you worship? What is, what has the highest priority in your life? What is it that you hold and esteem above all else? That's worship. I hope it's the Lord, yes? The Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul began to explain that. Uh, there's something a lot better to worship than this black meteor that fell from the sky, and that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And how freeing it is to come out of anything where you put anything above God, and now you begin to set the priorities right in your life. So... Christians started to study the word of God. They began to worship with other believers. They got involved of acts of love towards those around them. And it started to hit 
the wallets and the pocketbooks of those who worked in the city of Ephesus. And again, not everybody's going to throw a party when you give your life to Jesus. I think we've heard stories about that before. And you probably have some stories about that in your own life. The merchants of Ephesus lost their, well, they lost their ever-loving cotton-picking minds is what they did. Because when they saw this happening, what did they see happening? God redeeming lives. You know, probably the shows that I enjoy the most uh, on, uh, I can tell you the shows I enjoy the most on YouTube or, or what have you, are all those where something is broken down and they fix it. Cars that they, barn finds, you know? Have you seen any of those barn finds where they pull out a car that's just totally destroyed and then they rebuild it? in 45 minutes, it's really awesome. And uh, at the end of the show, you have this great car, you know, that, that looks really beautiful. Or, or somebody purchases, you know, there's this couple that I've been watching that purchased a, oh, a barn in Portugal. <laughs> and they have been redoing it, you know. And uh, even you watch every week as they, as they you know, uh, clean and paint and polish and, and that kind of thing. Well, some of us, some of our lives, are like old barn finds. <laughs> Something that nobody else sees value in, but God does. And God looks at you, and he looks at me, and he says, I love you, and I have great plans for your life. And I see the things that have hurt you, and I see the things that have broken you down, and I want to speak over your life light and love and newness of spirit. That's our God. And that's what was happening in Ephesus. But th these folks that are running the city, they're not seeing anything but dollar signs, and those are going down. So they're not happy at all. I'll tell you what. Uh, uh, in John chapter 3, verse 19, we can read, this is the verdict. Don't you like that? You can see the gavel dropping. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. It's like somebody saying, uh, don't, don't shine a light here on what I'm doing. Versus we believers are, Holy Spirit, turn on the light. Let, show me the path. Show me where I'm off. Bring wholeness to me. You know, bring integrity. Whatever it is that you think you've been missing out or have not had in your life, that's what God wants to restore, to redeem, to rebuild, you know, to paint and to scrape off and to make new. And, and we're just those who say, go for it. And again, as you say, go for it, what happens is God does that. It's like giving him, it's like a master craftsman coming up to you and saying, you know, oh, I see this piece of furniture in your house. Uh, and you know what? I can rebuild that and make it even better than new. Will you give me permission to do that? And that's what it is when the Lord comes to us. I see what's broken. I'm a master craftsman. I know how I made you. I know what it is I want you to be and how I can use your life in this fallen world. So allow me then, will you give me permission? Will you cooperate with me as I rebuild your life? All right, go to verse 23. Let's just kind of walk through this. And about that time, when people are getting saved, forgiven, and going to heaven, there arose a great commotion about the way. Who's the way? Christians. Yeah, that's us, isn't it? We are the way. We're the followers of the way. Jesus is the way and we follow him. For a certain man named Demetrius. Okay, Demetrius has got to be some kind of leader. As a matter of fact, I look at Demetrius as a, he's like in charge of a union local, right? 
So watch this. So Demetrius, a silversmith, yeah, he works as a silversmith. He made silver shrines of Diana. I bet you they were very expensive and beautiful. Brought no small profit to the craftsmen. See, it, he, it brought no small profit to the craftsmen. I think he's a leader of a local. Silversmiths of Ephesus, <laughs> 101, you know. Verse 25, he called them together. So he has this plan and he brings this meeting together of the workers with similar occupations. What would similar occupations be? You know, trinkets, right? Uh, uh, T-shirts that say, you know, I vacationed in Ephesus, something like that, you know. And he said to them, men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. So he's like, hey, here's where we make our money. Moreover, you see in here that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all Asia. Now, this is a non-believer talking about the spread of the gospel in all of Asia. In fact, the seven churches that are listed in the book of Revelation, they're all out of Asia. This Paul, that's Paul the Apostle, has persuaded and turned away many people, saying they are not God's which are made with hands. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, if you imagine somebody making something with their hands and saying, hey, somebody's telling me that this is not a God. You better believe we'll do that, right? Now, Christians, I believe, from the world's perspective, they think that we are against more things that we are for, right? Uh, we really have a very positive message. The message goes like this. We're all fallen, right? We're all sinful. We're all in the same basket together. But here's the good news. There's a Savior that loves us. And he wants to pull us out of darkness and bring us into light. That's our message. So what I don't see, what's conspicuously missing here for me, is I don't see Paul the Apostle uh, uh, you know, let's do a march <laughs> against Ephesus and against, you know, down with silver, down with silver, you know. He's not doing that. What he's doing is his message is very positive. And as he delivers this positive message of the gospel, forgiveness of sins by faith in Jesus Christ, period, <laughs> People begin to believe this. The truth is strong all by itself. It doesn't need you. <laughs> it's been said that the gospel is like a lion in a cage. You don't have to convince people of how strong the lion is. Just open the cage. And they'll see. So it is with the gospel. So we're on a very positive track. All right. Verse 27. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute. You know, people are going to think that it's wrong to worship things that other men make with their hands. Boy, that would be terrible. But also the temple of our great goddess, little g, Diana, which, believe me, it's backed by demons may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all Asia and the world worship. Uh, we want all to know and to worship the one true living God. Amen? And there's only one of those. And that is the Father who sent the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you put faith in him, it's the Holy Spirit that it dwells us. So the whole city was filled with confusion. Oh, wait. Uh, now, when they heard this, they were full of wrath. So they are hating Christians. Do you, you remember me telling you the story, don't you, of that teacher in Virginia, fifth grade teacher, on account of, uh, what's that teaching called? CRT. Yeah, CRT. Critical race theory. Critical race theory. So she had to get up in front of her class and she had to apologize to her class. I'm sorry that I'm your teacher. I'm sorry that I am white. 
that I am female and that I am a Christian. And she burst into tears after that, left the classroom and quit the school. Does that break your heart? <laughs> it's just like, it's like, if I, when I look at the world today, I think to myself, common sense is gone. You know, it just evaporated somewhere overnight, you know. People used to have it, you know, in spades, and now common sense is just gone. That is wrong as wrong can be. There are some people that are very angry at us. They say that you are against people with alternate sexual proclivities, desires. Nothing could be further from the truth. Again, we love everybody. And we want everybody to come and know the Lord. But here's the world is saying, oh, here's another thing that the world is saying about uh, Christians. You're not allowing a woman to have control of her own body. Wrong. We love all women. We want them to have control of their bodies. We just don't want them to have control of another body that's not theirs, which would be the baby that's growing inside of them. And so they're just, there's some people that absolutely hate us on account of that. Um, here's another one. Uh, and there's, oh my goodness, you can find plenty of people speaking out about this and plenty of people writing about this, that they hate the church because uh, we believe in strong masculinity. Guess what? We do. <laughs> but we don't believe in chauvinists. We don't believe in mistreatment of women. What we do believe in is the strength of a man to follow Jesus Christ above all else and the rest of it falls into place we don't hate because of that we love you know <laughs> i can't think of anybody who would not walk in here that we would not recognize that god loves them and he has a plan for their life and it's spelled out in his word we're the ones that hold forth truth in love right we hold forth truth with grace always that's who we are but here's people with wrath and they're crying out saying, great is Diana of Ephesus. You know, they probably had March, you know, probably had a great is Diana of Ephesus day, you know, at Disneyland. Right? <laughs> so that's, that's how it works. So the whole city was filled with confusion. Oh, this is great. Somebody tell me who's the author of confusion. Satan. He's the author of confusion. So there's people there at this riot. They don't even know why they're there. I don't know if you saw this or not, but you know, there's been so many things taken down. And if anybody should know about riots, it should be us in the last two years. We've seen nothing but riots causing lives, a permanent injury, and hold on to your hats, billions <laughs> of dollars of destruction of good people's businesses you know well they had some interviewers that were out there and they were asking people you know why are you here they didn't even know well my friends are here and we're going to meet down at the coffee shop you know to burn it down and uh this is just great you know all yeah people of my age we're and you're just like oh my goodness you're confused the, the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theater. The theater is still there. Holds about 30,000 people. They rush into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius, Artistarches, Macedonians, Paul's traveling companions. All right, stop for just a second. Because we need to connect with this real quick, okay? All right. Some of us were into all kinds of junk in the world, yes? <laughs> right? Oh, you guys, come on, let's be truthful here. We were into all kinds of junk in the world, yes? yes. Okay, what if through the back door right now uh, came uh, some guys and they grabbed a hold of some of us and they said, you used to buy marijuana from me. <laughs> and now my money's going down because it's not. And other, You used to be in a gang with me. We're going to drag you out of here, you know? You're hurting our pocketbook. 
Whatever it is, you know, whatever it was. You used to come to my bar every Sunday evening. Now you're not spending any money in my bar anymore, you know? So they drag you off. Some of these things we may see happen. Are you with me on this? The way things are going, some of these things may happen even in the good old U.S. of A. And some of us may be dragged off before courts on account of hate speech. You just keep loving. You just keep loving. And God, if God has you here, which he does, I mean, on planet Earth, then he's going to give you the strength and the wherewithal to deal with that should that come up before Christ raptures us out of here. So they rounded up all these people. Look at verse 30. When Paul the Apostle wanted to go into the people, isn't he great? I just love Paul the Apostle. He goes, I'm going to go in there and give one of my men and brethren, <laughs> you know. I don't know if that would have gone on very well. You know, they'd have strung him up. He wanted to go in to the people. The disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia who were Paul's friends See, I'm telling you, Christians are the best. Christians who really live their faith, they have integrity. They don't steal. They pay their taxes. They're good citizens. They try to live quiet lives. Amen? <laughs> they love everybody. Yeah, let's arrest them. Let's call them the haters. Makes no sense. So some who were Paul's friends sent to him, pleading that he would not venture into the theater. I would say about this, Paul gets by with a little help from his friends. <laughs> yes? <laughs> and let me tell you this. I think that sometimes the most radical thing that you can do as a believer is to be quiet. And let God do what God's going to do. You don't have to jump into every situation. You can be quiet and you can pray. Not only that, but I think it is absolutely radical. It is cross-grain for somebody like you, for somebody like me, to determine they're going to live for Jesus the rest of their life. That's radical. That is so radical to the world. So you live that radical, quiet, peaceful, loving life, and people will begin to see a change in you. Your conversation will be different. Those people who know and love you, perhaps within your own family, will be like, what's going on with you? You know? And you could say, God's doing something in my life. It's not me. It's God doing something in my life. And I know that God loves you too. And just let God work these things out within you. Have what you would call a quiet riot. <laughs> you remember that group? <laughs> We're the ones that keep peace with everybody, aren't we? Look at verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing and some cried another. <laughs> it really was filled with confusion. For the assembly was confused and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude. The Jews put him forward. This is not a Christian. This is somebody who is following Judaism. There had been a split between Judaism and Paul the Apostle going to the school of Tyrannus. You remember this? And teaching for the last three years. And Alexander motioned with his hand. And wanted to make his defense. He's like, this right is getting out of hand. Don't lump us Jews in with those Christians. You have live peaceably with what's going on at the Temple of Diana for all these years. And now Paul the Apostle, the last, last three years with Christians, has caused this confusion. Don't lump us in with them. Isn't that sad? Verse 34, but when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out for about two hours. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Jesus prayed in John chapter 17, and he said the following. 
to the Father. Talk about me having wanted to be a fly on the wall and to hear Jesus pray. Wouldn't you love that? So here's Jesus and he's praying to the Father before the cross. He prays, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Boy, that just, that just touches me. Let's pick it up together in verse 35. And when the city clerk, that's like a mayor appointed by Rome, had quieted the crowd, this is after two hours, he said, men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that the city of Ephesus, of the Ephesians, is temple guardian of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Zeus? Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. This guy is some kind of politician, isn't he? For you have brought these men here who are neither robbers of temples nor blasphemers of your goddess. See, Paul was doing the positive and not fighting the negative. Even this uh, mayor says this. Verse 38, therefore, if Demetrius, you remember he's the local president, and his fellow craftsmen have a case against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. He's talking about the due process of law. But if you have any other inquiry to make, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly, for we are in danger of being called into question for today's uproar, there being no reason which we may give to account for this disorderly gathering. Anybody got any idea what the Roman army would do when there was a riot? You're right. They would come in like a ton of bricks and they would fall on a the city. Uh, the way they operated was you can worship any God that you want as long as it doesn't cause us problems. <laughs> if it causes us problems, then you have Roman peace, Pax Romana is gonna roll into your city and you're not gonna like it. Now this was well before uh, they started uh, defunding the Roman soldiers. Uh, just saying, it just, just appears to me that way. So uh, this speech is great. I, I like it. I like both what Demetrius said, where he said, uh, you know, they're telling, Paul's telling people to serve the one true living God and that Diana is not a God. And I liked that. I'll go right on Paul. And I like what this guy says. And it was God who touched this guy to come forward and uh, be used by God to protect the believers. In John's gospel, Jesus said, for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. It's a great reason why we gather here. We gather here for praise and worship, for fellowship, uh, we gather here together for refueling. Okay, I want to say, look at verse 19. This is the last verse. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly, which I'm about to do. But I wanted to say, um, some people look at ministry and look at ministering 
as something that happens on Sundays or Wednesdays or whenever we gather together. No, it's not. Ministry is what happens in your lives between Monday to Saturday. And then when you come in here, my job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, the Bible says, that takes place when you leave here. So this is like, anybody here remember the full service gas stations? Yes. Okay, let me talk to you younger ones for a moment here. When I was a kid, you could pull into a gas station and they would come and they'd clean your windows and they would check the tire pressure on your tires. You remember this? <laughs> they checked the tire pressure on your tires. They, if you had a question about your engine, you could ask them. And they, you say, oh, it's making this knock. And they say, oh, well, start it up and let me listen to it. You know? They, and they would help you out. And then they would charge you 25 cents a gallon. I'm just saying. <laughs> actually, I, I remember when it was uh, 19 cents a gallon. I actually remember this. And the reason why I remember this is because uh, my dad was mowing the lawn and the lawn mower ran out of gas. And my dad's like, oh, can you get on your bike and ride down to the gas station, which was just like four blocks away, and fill it up with gas and then bring it back. And he reached into his pocket, pulled out a quarter, and flicked it to me. I grabbed the quarter, I filled it up, I came back with six cents, and he says, you can keep the change. <laughs> what a different world we've come into, you know? We weren't particularly heavy about locking the front doors and everybody knew everybody. Oh, man, okay. I am getting old. Uh, guess when that's going to happen again? When Christ returns. And you won't, it says you won't have to say anybody to anybody, do you know the Lord? You know you won't, why you won't have to say that? Because everybody will know the Lord. I look forward to those days. Do you? Yes. Amen. Okay, so we've learned a few things, haven't we, in this interesting kind of a story that the Lord included for us. And so uh, take these lessons home with you and, and let, let, like I started out at, this, at the beginning, let God do a work in you and, and submit to God's work in you and obey Jesus Christ. He takes care of the rest. Don't major in fighting. We do fight darkness. We don't major in fighting darkness. We, we major in doing what's right and following Jesus Christ, and he does the rest. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for my brothers and sisters and their lives as they, as they really strive to follow you. We know you're the way. We know you're the truth. We know you're the life. And we want to follow you. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would take this word that we studied today and that you would speak to us even tonight and through this week and to help us to digest it, to help us to walk with Jesus every day. For we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Let's all stand up.